Thank you to everyone for coming. I don't really do. And I want to say that tonight the shear should be Le'ili Nishmas for uh, Tyler's grandmother, Bella Lipschitz. Uh, this this sh- class should be a merit for her neshama. Okay. So we have a lot to discuss tonight. It's a double parsha, and it's Svira. So I like talking about Svira. Svira is Omer. So let's start. We'll take a little bit from Achremos, a little bit from Parshas Kedoshim. Some of the ideas we've discussed in previous years, but I want to take a little different spin on it, and I think they're very important ideas, and including myself, when you have an important idea, it's always important to go over it again and again and again, to drill it in, you have to drill it in. You know, the big Musa rabbis, Rishel Salanter, his, his, the way that, one of the ways that he suggested, that he taught to uh, make ethical improvements in ourselves is to constantly review the same statement of Chazal, let's say we're trying to work on humility, so to review that statement of Chazal over and over again with a tune and with emotion and just drill it in over and over again. That's one of the ways to improve one's character, to drill in that message. But okay, so let's start. We'll start in the middle of Parshas Acharemos. We'll oh, start. I you know, I'm not going to be so inside the Chumash. You're welcome to get one. I'm going to be more outside. I just want to read a couple Psukim, but feel free. Okay, page 648 in the Art School. Like the deeds of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, don't do. And to the land of Canaan, which I am going to bring you, don't do like them. And in their statutes shall, shall not follow. There is a prohibition that, now this isn't specifically the Egyptians and the Canaanites, but applies for all time, that the Jewish people have a mitzvah to be separate from the nations that surround us. Very important why, mitzvah. Why the, what? Why the, what do you mean? Yeah. Right. To be a holy people. So I want to discuss a little bit what makes, what, how are we different than the nations around us and what is included a little bit? <coughs> Sittas. Sittas. <coughs> right. That's why. So those are more, uh, those, are, those are mitzvahs. And those are definitely things that we do. But we're going to see there's more in addition to the mitzvahs that we do that separate us from the non-Jewish world around us, the secular world around us, there's actually more to it, believe it or not. For example, if you go to Lakewood, everyone is wearing white shirts and stuff and black hats. And if you go to New Square, you'll see everyone with furry hats and curly side locks. Where does that come from? What are they doing? How come we're not doing it? Should we be doing it? How come they speak English in a different dialect? How come some of them don't even speak English? No, you do it. What? Maybe no, I don't think we you don't think we should. No. After this class, you might change your mind. So let's see. I would like to read Maybe from the Rambam. 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 We'll see. We'll see. Here. Was the manufacturer in a plaid shirt? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure no one kicked you out. No. I'm sure they were very nice. Anyway, Rabbi Leiter just quoted a, a Rambam. I would like to quote another Rambam. This is in the Laws of Idolatry, eleven one. He says, Ain't, and he's based on the verse that we just read. Don't follow the ways of the non-Jews. Don't be similar to them. Not in the way you, you not in the way you dress. Not in the way you cut your hair. And another similar thing. As it says, it says, don't go in the ways of the nations of the world. And it says, and do not go in their statutes. It says. Be careful lest you become ensnared by them. It's all one idea. The idea is that we shouldn't be similar to them, but we should be separate. So the Jewish people has to be separate. Because the Jewish people have a separate mission that the nations of the world do not have and don't relate to. We have a totally different value system than the nations of the world. The mission of a Jew is to... The values of a Jew is the Torah, to fulfill the commandments, and to be a servant of God, in order that eventually Hashem will reveal Himself to the world, and the whole, whole world will recognize that God is one. That is, yeah. Right. And that is the value of a Jew. That's what's yeah, most... Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's the goal of a Jew's life. And that should be there. Therefore, that should be everything he does in his life should be towards that goal. The non-Jews, they don't have that. They have other goals. They want to be successful in their business lives and with their 
okay, whatever they want to do, money, power, but it's not their our, wives, their girlfriends, whatever, 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 it might, whatever, whatever, whatever it might be, but the idea is, is that since their goals are so diametrically opposed to our goals, we have to be separate, and not only in our values, but our, we have to be separate in the way we comport ourselves also. And that's what the Rabbim continues. He says, Malbusho Jews should be recognizable in their dress and their other deeds. People dress as a Jew. Right? Even if we're not, that's first of all, that's why in Lakewood people dress differently. People wear, you know, black hats, and it's one of the reasons black hats. For sure that's why the Hasidim do it. The Hasidim took it to another level. They wear the, you know, on Shabbos especially, they wear the Strymel or the Spudik, you know, the fur, fur hat. How, how did it originate? I, think, I, I believe it was the. One cold winter. I believe it was the clothing of the Polish nobility in the 1800s, mm-hmm. but it stuck, and they stuck. They stuck with it when the. I think they used to wear it also back in the day, but now they keep it because they want to be separate. They don't want to intermingle. You'll find, especially this wasn't such an as much of an issue if you were living in Eastern Europe in the shtetl and you didn't have a choice but to intermingle with the neighboring uh, folks. Yeah, they didn't let you. You were separate. You were in the shtetl. But now in the United States of America, this is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. We're very lucky to live here. As remo- we know, Ramosha Feinstein says the United States is a country of kindness. And we're very privileged to live here. However, with that privilege comes a little bit, more not a little bit, comes actually a danger that we will assimilate. And I don't know if anyone at this table is aware, but assimilation is quite high. What's the, what's the intermarriage rate now? 70%. 70% the intermarriage That's the most right. unkindness of all of that. Assimilation is the most unkindness of all. Not our day. You're going to say right. 7-0. And what's scary is, in that, are all Jews. The Orthodox, which is very low, is in that, in other words, is in that also. So if you were to subtract the Orthodox out of that, it would be much higher. higher. Wow. Yeah. So they wear, they wear this because we have separate values. We have different goals. And we don't want to assimilate. There's a lot of uh, enactments that are made. I was just learning today about Pas Akum. The, the Chazal, the rabbis, made a enactment that you not, are not allowed to eat bread cooked by a non-Jew. Now, getting into the details, we're very lenient with that nowadays, but the idea was because the rabbis didn't want Jews and non-Jews mingling to the point that would lead to intermarriage and things like that. Now, we're obviously supposed to be nice. It's not to say we're not supposed to be nice and friendly, maybe Kiddush Hashem, but we have to recognize that we have a different value system, and we have to preserve that value system by being separate. Now, so that's why the Hasidim wore strimals, the Yeshiva Bachim wore hats and jackets. Also, we're part of an army, right? These people, they dedicate their lives to living for Torah and fear of heaven, and they act like that. So they wear the uniform of the army. Now, other reasons, uh, other reasons people dress in a certain way is, you know, if you're dressed in a black hat and a yarmulke, you're a little bit more hesitant to do a sin, that's that's also another idea. Everybody's watching this. Yes, another because you know that you'll be on. Even if you don't do a sin, you'll be on the cover of New York, the New York Post. Actually, it just happened a few months ago. There was a an Orthodox man who was accused of doing something. He put his picture in the New York Post. Everything. One rabbi said, "Let's wait till the facts come out before we see what happened." People attacked him like crazy. How can you defend this man? That he's been accused of a horrible thing. You have been from the doubt. That's well, the word accused. Turns out by the next day, a video. They had a video of the alleged events which happened, and it clearly shows the man did nothing wrong. It was as clear as day. So, everybody, every Orthodox Jew knows if they do something wrong, they'll be on the cover of the New York Post, and even if they don't do something wrong, they'll be on the cover of the New York Post. But, right. Okay. Anyway, as a side point. Or victim. Right. And the other idea is that if you're Yeshiva Bakr, you're representing Torah. I just read, you know, Chaim Kanievsky, when people used to go visit him, he used to always tell people to grow beards. I can't, I can't testify to the veracity of this. I, I know he told a lot of people that to, to grow beards. So I never knew why. But I, I read somewhere, so I, this part I can't testify to the veracity, but he said people, he wanted people to have beards because then they look like a Jew. They have a beard. They look like a, a Torah. Obviously, they're just for the men. That... They look like uh, you should be proud if you if you study if you study Torah, you should be proud to dress like a Torah Jew and Torah and uh, Jews have uh, beards. He didn't like that people should change their mode of dress in order to fit in with the culture, the surrounding culture. We should be proud. We have a very important thing in the Torah. We should be very proud. The Rambam. Yeah. Most men grow their beards as soon as they get married and have the first child. So they start growing the beard. Yeah, it's very common. Yeah. Very common. They say that uh, mm. Rav Weinberg, who is the yeshiva where I went to yeshiva before I got there, he said that a single man with a beard is like wearing a tie with pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, if you have a beard, you're like 
you're not a beard shows the chashivas and importance. So you're not married yet, you don't have a family, you don't have that importance. So it's like wearing a tie with pajamas. But anyway, side point. So that's the idea. The Ramam continues. Kamoshu who moved the Ramam says he should his dress should be different because just like he's separated from the non Jewish world in his ideas and his values. And like we mentioned, the purpose of life is to serve Hashem. So you'll notice by big Torah scholars, certain things, you know, that we would get very excited about. They could care less. They say that Rav Scheinberg, once, Rav Scheinberg was a rabbi in Israel who passed away maybe 10 years ago. He was over 100. He wore many, many pairs of tzitzis. But he grew up in New York. And he was a big Yankee fan. And they claim that in his 80s, he made a kiddush on Shabbos to celebrate something. What was the kiddush? It was the first time the Yankees won the World Series and he didn't care anymore. <laughs> right? that, was, that was his values. There's a, a story that I that I actually heard, I heard on, the, on, a, on a tape from the rabbi himself. There's a rabbi in Muncie who was on a plane. Someone chartered. I, I forgot if they. I think it was. In, it was a first class ticket to speak somewhere. He's on this plane, and there's this African American gentleman next to him with a little thin pencil mustache, and he says to him, um, "Hi, uh, do you want my autograph?" And the rabbi had no clue who this man was. <laughs> he said he's busy preparing his shear for where he's going and. The guy says to him, um, like, uh, don't you know who I am? <laughs> and <laughs> kind of rapper? Or, um, I'll tell you who it was. Musician? I'll tell you the end of the story. <laughs> the the rabbi, I'll tell you at the end of the story who it was. <laughs> and, and the rabbi's like, well, he said, like, he was just trying to focus on his class. He had no idea who this guy was. He could care less. He's just being interrupted by some annoying guy on a plane. He's trying to, he's trying to write his, uh, his class. Uh, and then the guy says, uh, do you want my autograph? He's like, I don't want your autograph. He's like, I, I've never asked to meet you, but I really need to prepare this class. So at the end of the plane ride, he, the, this gentleman gives him a note, and it says, uh, to my biggest fans, love Little Richard. Oh, it's Little Richard. It was Little, it was little Richard. So the, the rabbi didn't actually, to his credit, he didn't say publicly who the person was, but then I found out through the grapevine who the famous person was. But the idea is, to Little Richard, what's the most important thing in the world and to many of our people we live around? Notoriety. Famous, notoriety, wealthy, invented rock and roll. This rabbi could care less. What's important to him? He's about to give a Torah class to a bunch of people and he wants to make sure it's good. He wants to inspire people. He wants to help people to get, the cl- to get close to Hashem. This, the rabbi's values and Little Richard's values couldn't be further apart. So we have nothing in common. We have nothing in common with that. The Torah, Jewish values have nothing in common. So wow, we don't we dress like that. We don't dress like that. We do differently. So there was a big rabbi. My Rashiva wrote in his book that I forgot if it was he, him that asked this rabbi or somebody else. That's a, a big rabbi who grew up in Europe. He said, "How come we don't have so many as many great Torah scholars as we did in Europe?" So he says, "Let me." He says, oh, yeah, "That's for sure." You, you know when Robin Williams was interviewed in Germany. They asked him how how come there's no more how come there's no funny people in Germany. Robin Williams said because you killed them all. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back back to East back to the rabbis of Eastern Europe. What? Uh, so this the yes, this rabbi who grew up in, in Eastern Eastern Europe. How come we don't have as many Torah scholars as we used to? So this rabbi from Eastern Europe says when I was growing up, everybody wanted to be you know what everyone every child wanted to be wanted to be the Kovner of. Ravitsa Kachan Inspector was the Gadol Hador. He passed away, I think, in I think he passed away in 1896. <coughs> he was the biggest rabbi of the generation. Every kid wanted to be like him. He says they used to go to shul and they would try to memorize pages of the Talmud and see who could memorize the most pages. Mm. He says, who do kids in America look up to? Sports stars, Mickey Mantle. He says, and you ask me why we don't have as many Torah scholars mm. in America as we did in Europe? It was, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. Distraction. He said there was no bigger embarrassment to be an ignoramus. That was uh, that was the biggest embarrassment wow. to be a, to be an amaret. You know, I'll tell you what's a big distraction: the Rangers and the Devils. That's a big distraction. I want to try to get away from that and into Torah. Good. That's what we're here, and you're here. You're here Thursday night to to, to study Torah. Yeah. But that's it's like, you know, the first that's step. Pro- you know, that's a, it's a whole process. This whole thing mm-hmm. to get away from that. It goes in, it goes in stages. You know. You start learning Torah, and the more you learn, the more you get into it. The more you get into it, the more you want to learn Torah, and the less other things are important. Right? Yeah, the more important. Right. right? And then it's a process, and you get to a point sure. where the other things you don't even see. You don't even want it. You, you, you dislike it because it's in your way because it's not. You have no connection to it. Anymore. Right, right. 
you know, including sports or whatever. I used to be into sports. I kicked it to the curb. The best thing I ever did in my life. I don't even, I don't miss it. I mean, not even a little bit. I mean, I just don't miss it anymore. I truly what? don't. The opposite. I'm angry with myself. I spend too much of my life, you know, watching the stupid stuff. I mean, but it's a process. You got to start somewhere. You know? Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not saying like tomorrow night we should all try to memorize and memorizing as many you know pages of the Tama that we can. But I mean, if you're up to that, then go for it. But whatever level we're at, yeah, you have to go. But the idea is that we have. We know it. We have to know where the goal is, because otherwise, how can we get to a goal? Right? How can you run a race if you don't know where you're running to? What? What's the goal? The goal is to to do as many mitzvahs as we can, to have the deepest connection to Hashem as we can, to learn as much Torah as we can, and to make these values as a part of our life as much as they can, as much as we can. But that's that one for the 18th... Shmona Esther? Yeah, that's what that does, doesn't it? Like, each one of them is another connection to Hashem. Totally, yeah. That's part of it. Uh, it's one of the, the three things that the world is built on, so that's Torah, prayer, and good deeds. So prayer is uh, one of them, a voda. But, uh, you know, we should... It's yeah. sort of a misnomer, though. Give me the foot. Mitzvah is commandment, not good deeds. Oh, so by 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 good deeds, I should say, has to doing kind things to other people, which is a mitzvah of the haftal recha kamocha of loving your neighbor of yourself. But what I'm trying when we share great stories about these great rabbis, the idea is that we shouldn't be like that overnight, but just to see where we can where we can go, where we can reach. Now, if we feel pressure, now it's very nice to talk about it as we're in a shul. Right, no peer pressure here, but you go out into the world, there is peer pressure to want to be respected and accepted by the nations of the world and be wealthy and be important and everyone should say how great you are and, you know, whatever it is. So what I always like to think about when I feel pressured by the values, and we all have it implicitly, we all grew up in the United States of America, right? As much as we try, we were born with it, it's in us, and it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for our whole lives, and as Alan's saying, you know, it's, it's definitely a process. What I like to think about any time I feel pressured that I should conform to non-Jewish values. Think of the end of this week's Parsha, Parsha Kedoshim. There's a mitzvah about Molech. You know what Molech was? It isn't a Vodazara. You know, it's a very specific type of Vodazara that we're prohibited from doing. This Vodazara is where somebody would take their child and sacrifice. sacrifice their child by passing them through fire. And we're prohibited from doing that. Now, the fact that we're prohibited from doing that means there were a lot of people that were doing this back in the day. They believe that by sacrificing their child in this disgusting, horrific way, good things would happen to them. Now picture yourself, you live in a city. Go back to Manalapan, whatever, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, wherever you're living, and all of your neighbors are, hey, it's, it's Molech Day. They're all taking their six-year-old kids and they're going to sacrifice their kids to uh, the fire, through the fire. Right? <laughs> But you think about the peer pressure that you would have had back in the day, right? All of your neighbors are doing it. They believe that you're not going to have make a living. You have, you have five kids. Your other four kids aren't going to make it unless you sacrifice one of them. Like, you have to do it. And they're looking at you like, who's that weird Jewish guy who's not sacrificing his kid? Wow, what a weirdo. You know, what, a, what, a, what a loser. I, I promise you it was like that. And, and so then I apply that to today and think, there are certain things I'm not going to mention, but I think we can very easily conjure up certain things that society favors today. Mm -hmm. that we think is absurd, but there's a peer pressure like, oh, you have to approve of this movement or this ideology. Oh, yeah. And if you don't do it, you're a wacko. Mm -hmm. oh, so, I'd rather be the little. wacko. <laughs> right, but there is a peer pressure. So just think, back in the day there was Molech, people sacrificing their kids to the fire, and uh, they would have looked at you the same way. And a thousand years from now, they'll look back and say, wow, people really believe that? Wow, the Jews were the only normal ones back in the day. Okay. That was Parshas Achrimos. I would like to share a little bit, a little bit about Parshas Kedoshim, and then a little bit about Sphira. So Parshas Kedoshim, we've talked about this many years. I think it's very important. It says Kedoshim to you. Just to piggyback on something Alan said, there's a mitzvah to be holy. What does it mean to be holy? Does be holy mean that we should all stay, come to Union Hill after Shacharis, uh, have a little piece of bread, drink a little water, and then say Psalms the entire day until Mincha at 7:30? And Davin Mincha, listen to the rabbi, Davin Marv, have a little bread and water, and then say Psalms the rest of the day and go to bed and then repeat and repeat. Is that what it means to be holy? No. No. Is no. anybody here to work? Didn't Hashem say for Adam to go and make his bread so he has to work? Right. So I'm saying that. No, so I meant to say this is not what the Torah is saying. People think when they think of holy. When, right. When people think of being holy, that's what they think being holy is talking about. That's not what being holy is. Rashi says being holy means that there are certain boundaries that are set between the 
intermingling of the genders. There are only two genders. And that people, there has to be a separation between a men and women, because the Torah recognizes, well, Hashem wrote the Torah, Hashem created human beings. Hashem created human beings with a lust. And specific, so, right, so there is a mitzvah that so there is an idea in the Torah that men and women are separated. That's why, one reason, there's a mechitza in the synagogue. That's why there are laws of yichud. A man is not allowed to be secluded with a woman who is not his wife, unless it's under very specific circumstances. Someone told me they saw the regulations of the United States Army, and they have laws, they have rules, not laws, they have rules in the rule book about how men and women are supposed to act with each other. And he says, if you would read it, it sounds like the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law and the Laws of Yichud, that a man can't be, a, one ma- male soldier can't be alone with a female soldier, and it goes on and on about all these uh, yeah, things. I'll let you all right. So, it it when there's a separation between men and women, that breeds holiness. Because if we're constantly engaged in our physical desires, in our taivas the entire day, mm-hmm. there's no way, there's no possibility that we can devote ourselves for... Serving Hashem, like we said, is the purpose of a Jew. In fact, when the Jewish people don't engage in holiness, and there's too much intermingling of the genders, right? First of all, <clears throat> this is why different communities, obviously, there's certain things that are law, Jewish law, halacha, that you have to do. And then there are certain what we would call hidurim, beautifications of the law. So if you go to Lakewood, they'll have certain practices there. Not everything is required by the law, but the idea is coming from this idea, that to keep the gender separate, to keep holiness. Now, if you go to New Square, they'll have different, you know, practices. There's a verse in the Torah that's very important about this. It says, Ki Hashem alokecha mishalach b'kerev machanach al-atzilcha. Hashem goes with you to save you, al-atzilcha v'lasi soyvecha l'fanach, and to give your enemies in front of you, v'haya mechanach al-kadosh, that your camp should be holy, v'l'yir b'cha erva z'dabar, that you shouldn't see uh, nakedness, type of thing, v'shav mecharacha, that he will turn away from you. It's an explicit verse in the Torah, that when we're not careful about the separation of the sexes, and there's intermingling like that, and there's not holiness, and people are doing things they shouldn't be doing, that's when Hashem turns away from people. That's when Hashem... But the Jewish people, here it's talking about the Jewish people, the more the Jewish people are careful with this, then the more it, the Hashem will watch us, and the other way, if we're not careful, that Hashem will turn away. Because and the idea is, again, if we're engaged in these physical desires, then we don't have a chance to live up to our mission. So I just want to... So that's Rashi's ex- explanation. The Ramban says the explanation of to be holy means that the Torah says a lot of do's and don'ts. So he says there's a way you could live where you could be uh, what he calls a novel birshus Torah, which is technically... which means a disgusting person with permission of the Torah. How so? He says technically, you could get up in the morning and you could stuff yourself with meat and drink wine and have relations with your wife all day. And that's how you spend your day. So did you violate any Torah prohibitions? No. You ate kosher meat, you ate kosher wine, you're allowed to have relations with your wife. But the Torah says, Kedoshim to you, be holy. That's not how you should act. Those things are allowed, but we have to live for spiritual pursuits. Because, like we mentioned, the culture of Judaism, the purpose of a Jew, is to serve Hashem, mm-hmm. is to be an Evan Hashem. I just want to finish talking about Svira. Svira, as we talked about last week, is the 49 days we count from Pesach until Shavuos. And Shavuos is when we get the Torah. So traditionally, this is a time where we improve on our Torah study. So if we learn one Mishnah a day, now would be the time to increase it to two Mishnahs a day. If we come to one Torah class a week, now would be the time to go to two Torah classes. Or if perhaps sometimes we get distracted. I know myself, I can get distracted when I learn. So maybe we'll minimize those distractions. Shut our cell phones off for the hour that we decide to learn. Right, the first, the, what they ask you after a person dies, they ask you, did you set aside time for Torah? They didn't just say, did you learn Torah? But did you set aside time? If Torah is like... Not so important. Okay, you'll learn Torah when you, have, uh, when you have some time. But if Torah is really important to you, you'll set aside a time that at 12 o'clock, that's when I learn. No matter what's happening, I sit and learn at that time. So, a couple, a couple stories, quick stories. I just heard the Chavetz Chaim. Again, we're not on this level, but I'm just showing what Jewish values are. The Chavetz Chaim saw one of his relatives. I think it was something simple like putting up wallpaper in their house. So he says, why are you putting up wallpaper? What do you need wallpaper for? He says, what's the, what's the problem? Because wallpaper costs money. Money is time. Time is black Gemara. Pages of Talmud that you could have learned. That's how we viewed it. Right? So we look at a person, wow, he's so rich, he did so well, that's amazing. Chava Time would say, oh, he spent so much time working to, make, to get this huge house and all these luxuries that he don't really, really need. With that time, you know how many pages of Talmud you could have learned? How much Torah you could have studied? That's the difference between the secular values and the Torah values. Uh, Rav Ruderman was the founder of my yeshiva. So when he first came to Baltimore, he was a genius 
of I never met him. He died in 1987. I was born in 1986. But he, from when I was like not just a genius, but beyond any normal genius. And what he would do is he would in the middle of the day to relax, he would go for walks and he would study the Talmud in his head. He would review the Talmud in his head, the whole thing, whatever, whatever he was learning. So one time he they just he, <laughs> they're in Baltimore. This is before Baltimore was really bad in the city, and he was so focused on his learning. When he finished learning, he looked up, and he had no clue where he was. <laughs> he got lost. He didn't know how to get back to the yeshiva. So for those of us who remember, uh, I think we're all old enough to remember, telephone booths. So he called Rabbi Newberger, who was the president of the yeshiva, and he says, Hi, can you please pick me up? I got lost. I have no idea where I am. <laughs> and he says, What street are you on? He says, I'm on Telephone Street, because he was looking at the telephone booth. And <laughs> anyway, and then the last story, this I just heard recently. I think it was from, this is about Rishmul Birnbaum. It's also the, it was the Rosh Shiva the Mir. I believe it was him. I'm not 100% sure, but it was... A great rabbi. They were on the boat. They, you know, they the Mir Yeshiva. They left. They were successfully rescued from Nazi Germany, and then they were in uh, Kobe, Japan, and Shanghai. And they were, and then the, finally they took a boat. And some came to America, some came to Israel. So they were on the boat learning. Rishmul Birnbaum and Chavrusa. And someone came to him and said, uh, I think it was like Haley's Comet was coming by. The captain made an announcement. He said, "This is once in a 70-year chance you get to see Haley's Comet." Comet. So he's sitting learning, and his Chavrusa says, "Come on, we have to see it. We'll never get another chance." He says, no. He says, How can, what do you mean no? We're, we're, he says, we're learning right now. And he said, when will you ever have a chance to give up seeing Haley's comment to sit and learn Torah? That's how he viewed it. I have a once in 70 year opportunity to give up something to learn Torah. I'll never have this opportunity to give that up to study Torah in my, again in my life. So that's what I'm going to do right now. That's a whole different look. Okay, so the, just to summarize what we're saying here is that there, we see in the first Part in Akremos, there's a mitzvah to be separate from the, the, the non-Jewish nations, the secular culture, and that's because our values are different. We live here to serve Hashem, so we don't intermingle because we have different values. Uh, just a very good, this really stuck out to me. Rabbi Shiva said a very good mushroom. He said, in China, they don't study Huckleberry Finn. Right? We all grew up, we probably read Huckleberry Finn. They probably don't read it now because it's whatever. But when we, when, we, when we grew up, we all read Huckleberry Finn. Right? In China, they don't read Huckleberry Finn. Why not? It's a great book. It's not part of their culture. It's not part of their culture. So too, we're Jewish, we have a certain culture. The secular world around us, we get along nicely with them, but it's not our culture. It's different values, different cultural system. That's why we have to be separate, we dress separate, we act separate, our values are different, and uh, uh, we should, we should ble- be blessed to, uh, to carry that out. And just again, this, this shir is Le'ilo Nishmas, uh, Tyler's grandmother, Bella, Bella Lipschitz, and everyone should please take more chicken if there's left.